Welcome to the second history type video on my channel. And this time around, we're going to talk about Wiedekind of Corway's Deeds of the Saxons, which is a book that was written more than a thousand years ago, actually. So it is uh, somewhat something that only real history nerds will be aware of, but it should also be uh, rather difficult to come by for English speakers, I would assume, as most copies that I found are either in the original Latin or translated into German only, which of course is my mother tongue. Therefore, I decided to uh, bring you this book um, as some sort of a summary, a small one at that. I'm not going to be talking about in detail everything that's uh, going down there, but I'm going to talk about the parts that are at least interesting to me and that I think uh, could be in interesting to an international audience as well. So, before we start things off, I am not an expert on either history or languages, but I'm a dedicated student to both. So what that means is that I personally see a big, big connection between these two topics. History and language are very much intertwined. And for my personal preference, I will uh, pronounce the names of the people uh, that are involved in this story in the original German fashion. It will still be uh, easy to understand for English speakers and I will time and time again um, remind you which uh, of these names, what they are in English, but just for personal preference and because I think it makes more sense that way, I will pronounce them as German names as we're talking about Saxons mainly here and Franks of course as well. All right, so let's dive straight into this thing. For this video, I'm gonna be talking about only book one out of the three books that are uh, the Deeds of the Saxons by Widukind of Corway. And also I'm not going to be talking about the entire book. I'm going to split this first book into two parts. And now let's get right into the first book. Uh, first off though, about the author, Widukind was a monk in the Corway monastery during the 10th century. He models his chronicles after the statesman and historian of Rome, Sallust, and he, speaking of Widukind of Corway, is potentially, potentially related to Widukind, the great Saxon leader that was actually uh, struggling against Charlemagne or Charles the Great, or how I'm gonna be referring to him in this story, Karl the Great. And yeah, therefore it, it is possible that this historian Widukind is actually related to uh, the Saxon leader Widukind because Widukind is especially not today, but also not at that time, a very common name in Germany. And last but not least, Widukind of Corway actually knew Otto the Great personally, had a personal relationship with the man and actually dedicates uh, this story that we're going to be talking about to the daughter of Otto the Great. So there is always uh, some element of pandering to, uh, well, on one side, the family of the king and emperor and also to the uh, Catholic Church, of course. Widukind being a monk is always gonna be taking that into account. All right, now let's dive right into the story. The book begins talking about the origins of the Saxon tribe, the Saxon people. It has to be mentioned here that the word tribe, people, nation, all, all these things are rather modern terms. And it is not easy to translate the exact word that is used in this story to a modern equivalent, neither in German nor in English. So I'm going to be talking about tribes mainly, but it, it is somewhat of a wonky translation. All right, according to legend, and oral legend is what Widukind is referring to for the origin story of his people here, uh, the Saxons either descend from Danes, Norsemen or Macedonians of Alexander the Great, and arrived via ship in today's Lower Saxony at the uh, North Sea coast. They fought the Thuringians that had occupied the land before them and became known for their extraordinary bravery, brutality, force and long knives. The word Saxony actually might derive from the old German word Sax, meaning knife. Therefore the connection can easily be made. Sax, Saxon, Saxons, Saxony. I think you get the point. Uh, he then talks a little bit about the Saxons' relationship with the Angles and asserts that the Angles 
who were lacking the protective force of the Roman Empire at that time, asked the Saxons for help against the Picts and the Scots. And that was, of course, based on the Saxons' reputation of great strength and bravery. The Saxons followed their call, uh, fighting alongside the Angles, but then turned on them upon realizing how weak uh, they are. The Angles at that time don't have any mighty allies anymore, and therefore the Saxons make peace with the Scots and settle the Angles' lands. Later on, Widukind recounts a 6th century dispute of succession for the Frankish throne, the Frankish throne in this case uh, being one throne, of course the 6th century is before the great divide of the empire, between a legitimate Thuringian heir and an illegitimate Frankish one. 9,000 Saxon mercenaries aid the Franks in the struggle, and the Franks actually plot with the Thuringians, their enemies who they are fighting over the throne with, uh, to turn on the Saxons, realizing that the Saxons are very strong, and even if the Franks were able to beat the Thuringians with the Saxons' help, the Saxons then afterwards might still pose a great threat to Frankish dominance in the area. The Saxons learn of this plot and decide to strike against the Thuringians in the same night, succeed and therefore did not betray their alliance with the Franks but also now made it impossible for the Franks to turn on them with the aid of the Thuringians because they, as we just learned, were defeated by the Saxons within one night. The Saxons are then rewarded with the Thuringian territories and become friends of the Franks. Now we skip ahead to the time of Charlemagne, or Karl the Great. Karl Christianizes the Saxons by force and by negotiation. And a quote from the book says, So became those who used to be allies and friends of the Franks, hereby brothers. Remember, the author is a monk, and he spins this event as the ultimate blessing for the Saxon people, as becoming Christian means becoming civilized to him. And, more importantly, the Saxons claim to Charlemagne's legacy, the German claim to Charlemagne's legacy depends on them being equals to the Franks and also Christians, of course, which will play later on a huge part in being a Roman, Holy Roman Emperor. Now we skip ahead to the main part of the story, which is Conrad, at that point King of East Francia, versus Heinrich, or known to most of you probably as Henry the Fowler, at that point only the Duke of Saxony. So the relationship between the two is simple. Henry is a Duke in Saxony, the Duke of Saxony, excuse me, which is an area in the East Frankish Empire. Conrad is the king of all the East Frankish lands. During this time, frequent Hungarian raids occurred. According to legend, the Hungarians were a group of outcasts from a different tribe, ravaging civilized lands and taking them over. This story is very akin to that origin story of the Saxons, but Widukind uses completely opposite tone to describe the two. Of course, uh, the difference being here that the Hungarians were not Christians at that point, and therefore uh, described very negatively by the monk. Conrad, the king of the East Franks, tries to have Heinrich killed by intrigue. The Archbishop of Mainz actually kills Heinrich's brother, but fails trying to kill Heinrich himself. Conrad's brother leads an army against the Saxons, but loses. Conrad then sends the entire force of the Franks, the entire force they can muster, but gets avoided by a trick of Heinrich's. Conrad realizes Heinrich is blessed by God, smarter and more talented than him, and on his deathbed he asks his brother to make Heinrich the next king of East Francia, and to deliver to him the imperial regalia, being the crown and the spear, the holy spear of Christ. His brother does so, calls out Heinrich as the new king, but Heinrich accepts the title and then rejects the insignia uh, out of modesty, claiming that a more worthy carrier of the imperial crown should become the one to accept them, himself being a very modest leader. At that point in time, the story takes a short break, talking about one of the most important events at this, in this medieval area, era of time, the division of Karl's empire. Karl's son, Louis the Pious, in German Ludwig, splits his realm according to Frankish succession law among his three sons. The eldest, who is Lothar, 
gets the imperial title and Middle Francia. Ludwig, later known as Louis the German, gets East Francia, whereas Karl, known as Charles the Bald, gets West Francia. The Battle of Fontenoy more or less confirms these borders. 150,000 men allegedly fought on both sides, the two sides in that battle being the eldest son Lothar, who inherited the imperial title, fighting against his two brothers, Ludwig and Karl. In this battle actually Ludwig and Karl win, but the borders are more or less uh, remaining the same, the same as those that were laid down in the Treaty of Verdun. Now let's take a quick look at the map that was laid out in the Treaty of Verdun in the year 843. Of course we can see here the West, the Middle and the East Frankish Kingdom, which are the new realms of the grandsons of Karl the Great. It has to be noted though that Widukind in his story here actually describes the border of the Middle Frankish Kingdom as being the Maas River on the western side and the Rhine River on the eastern side. If you take a quick look at this map here, the Maas River is the river you can see coming down from Lüttich to Verdun and going straight south from there. So you can see the border actually differs a little bit from what Widukind says in his story. And more importantly, on the eastern side, uh, he says the Rhine River is the border, which is the river coming down from Köln to Mainz to Worms and then to Strasbourg. So there's a, an entire area in there, which is uh, the Palatine area, uh, that is, according to Wiedekind, actually part of the Middle Frankish uh, Kingdom. So this area and the area of Alsace-Lorraine, which in this map is Elsass and Lotharingen, um, these two areas are areas of great conflict in Europe among the next century, pretty much. So the origin of that, of all those disputes that follow in the next couple of hundred year, years lay in this treaty. And you can see already in this story by Wiedekind, uh, he has a different opinion of where the borders actually are than they were in the treaty, apparently, or at least according to this uh, Wikipedia map. But we can see very clearly this was a very dicey subject that all these three kings, uh, of course, uh, would continue to uh, rail against and so would their descendants, of course. All right, uh, at th this point we're gonna end this first episode. I'm gonna split, as I said before, this first book of the story in two parts. So look out for the next upload in which I will cover the remaining part of the book. I hope you enjoyed this so far and at the end of things I want to apologize for my mic quality actually. Uh, once I can afford or once I see fit to buy a new one I will definitely replace my old webcam mic that I'm currently using but I still hope you could gain something entertainment, entertaining out of this video. Alright, take care everyone and I'll see you next time.